everybody tonight? Good? Doing good? That's right. I'm doing good, too. I'm doing good, too, man. We've been challenged tonight, man. Challenged, but we will prevail. We will prevail. God is good, and uh, we had issues with our with our Facebook, and, and we're still having issues. Now it won't hear my microphone, so I'm going to try to use this handheld, so bear with me. But, uh, you know, we, uh, we've made a good choice here, I think, to uh, come and hang out in God's house this evening and to hang out with God's people and to sing God's praises and to hear God's word. And uh, so uh, to that endeavor, we want to be, you know, we want to be better worshipers, right? I want to be, I want to be a better Christian, not valued more by God, but I want to worship him correctly. And I hope that you're in on that game with me as well. And so in an effort to do so, uh, we started well, we started a long time ago, years ago, but we're, we're recently, we've been uh, studying through the book of Philemon, and we're going to call him Phil because we're a non-denominational church, and we don't fight about stupid stuff, so it doesn't really matter what the guy's name was, right? All that matters is what it says, and so we're just going to go with Phil, but we started a couple weeks ago studying the book of Phil, and I would invite you to grab a copy of God's Word and put it in front of your face and open it up to the book of Phil. We're going to reference that quite a few times here tonight. But while you're turning there, I just want to kind of go back a little bit and review a couple of the things that we talked about before we jump ahead and move forward. And we're looking for progress, right? I'm looking for progress tonight. You guys looking for progress tonight? I want to, I want to have some progress. See, I'm not convinced. I, don't, I think I only heard Jeff say he wanted to have some progress. The rest of you guys just want to stay where you are? No, no, no. We want progress, right? I want progress. So, so while we're turning to the book of Phil, I just want to say that we, we've been trying to figure out what a real Christian is, you know, not what he would look like necessarily, but how the person would act and think, their perspectives, their priorities. We want to know what we should be, and that's why we're here in church. But the first week we talked about that a real Christian is the one who engages with people, Right? He engages. She engages. How close to the cliff does a friend or a loved one need to get before you'll open your mouth with the truth of God's word to help them? And too many people that we know and love end up in the ditch, and we could have helped prevent that. And it's not just our brothers and sisters in the Lord that we should be talking to. You know that we talked about this a few weeks ago, but only 56% of people in America believe in the God of the Bible. So it's not just the believers that we should engage with. We should engage with everybody. They need to know the gospel. They need to know Jesus, right? That's the reason why this church exists. And so we need to open up our mouth. Remember the the, the verse that we talked about that... uh, it's a parenting verse. It's in Proverbs. It talks about that if you, if you hate your son, you'll spare that rod. You won't put the rod to your son. But if you love your child, you'll discipline them diligently, which means that you're supposed to engage with them frequently, consistently. Like, don't let your kid, if you love your kid, you wouldn't let your kid walk out in front of a car that's coming, right? You'd get on to them about it and teach them not to do that. Look both ways. Wait for your mom. Wait for your dad. You would engage a person that you love. And so we're supposed to engage with people. So a real Christian is one who engages. You know, the Bible says, how will they know unless they are told? Right? Now, we we need to see Christianity in action, but a, a, a big majority of seeing Christianity in action is hearing Christianity proclaimed. People need to hear it. How will they know unless they are told? So a real Christian engages and speaks up. The next one is that a real Christian obeys spiritual authority. And that was a tough one to preach, a tough one to hear. Nobody likes to be told what to do, including yours truly. I don't like anybody coming over my house and telling me what to do, ever. But the Bible says something a little bit different. We're supposed to obey our spiritual leaders and submit to them. Pastors and and elders and the overseers in the church, they're to be obeyed and submitted to. And and why is that? Because they're awesome? Should you listen to me because I have a diploma on my wall? You should listen to me because God has entrusted you into my care. That's what qualifies myself. That's what qualifies Jeff and Jay and Ramon. God has placed you under our care. And so because you have been placed under our care, it says you should submit and obey to what they say. Because if you do not, it says it's not going to be beneficial for you. Right? 
So you're supposed to listen. Not only that, it says make it easy for us. Don't be stubborn mules. Don't rebel all the time. Because we have to give an account to God for your soul. Like that's not easy, right? And so if, it's, if we have a tough day coming, well, we have to look into the eyes of Christ to give an account for your soul. Could you at least throw us a bone in the meantime and be cooperative? That's going to be a tough day. So let's make the days leading up to it a little bit easier, okay? So we're talking about a real Christian. And so let me just say this. We're, going to, we're, we're past that stuff. Now we're going to move on. We're going to progress, okay? So, so let me just say this. When I was getting ready to, to, to prepare this message series, I was kind of going back and forth about what title I should use. And then, of course, on the screen, you see it says, Get Real, A Real Christian Is. And so I was kind of going back and forth with, with that. And, and then maybe this one other logo. I asked my wife about it, and, I, and, I, and, and she chose the other one. Here, here's the other one. It's, it's authentic. She chose that one, so of course I chose the other one, because that's what guys do. Now, my wife's awesome and, and, and wise, and, and often I have to listen to her. But I was going to use that graphic right there, and, and, and because we want to find out what an authentic Christ follower is, you know, the real deal. And so we kind of went back and forth about, you know, what logo should we use? What graphic? Well, I didn't want to use this one. One of the reasons why I didn't want to use this one is because it's kind of redundant, you know? An, a, an, a, a real Christian is an authentic Christian. Now that kind of, that don't make much sense, really, because if you are a Christian, then you're authentic. It's kind of like some, you might have heard of this church before. They're, they have them all over the country. They're called Koinonia Fellowship. Did you ever hear of a church named Koinonia Fellowship? See, when you start a church, you've got to find a churchy name. And so some churches call themselves Koinonia Fellowship. You know what the definition of Koinonia is? Fellowship. It's the fellowship fellowship. <clears throat> Authentic Christianity is redundant. There's no reason to, to call us authentic Christians because if you are a Christian, a real Christian, you're authentic. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. And you know why we need to talk about it? Because um, the first week I shared something with you, and it's scary, and I hope it scared you. It scares me. There was a day when 70% of our country said that they claimed to believe in the God of the Bible, and that was discouraging enough, because I'd like it to be 100%, I don't know about y'all, but I would like to see that. But instead of going from 70 up to 100, it went from 70 down to 56%. 56% of the people in America believe in the God of the Bible. So we're, we're decreasing the church. Now, that doesn't mean we're decreasing the amount of people that are in churches, Christian churches. But we're decreasing Christianity in this country because we're not authentic, you see. Why do only 56% of Americans believe in the God of the Bible? We talked about the first week, some of that stuff that, you know, bad examples, so they get driven away. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's just that the people in America have gotten so much smarter now that they figured out that God isn't real. Did you ever hear that before? Yeah, he's a, you know, he was good back in the day, but he's a fairy tale, and we don't really believe, because we're smarter now. We're progressive. Did you ever hear that? We're progressive people now. Let me just tell you about how smart and intelligent Americans are. Do you, you, you guys know that people are eating Tide soap cubes? Real smart, huh? The, the Tide, Tide soap challenge. Let's eat laundry detergent. Yeah, real smart, right? Hey, did you hear the new one? See, that, that one's old history, man. That was like last month. Now they're doing condom snorting. Did you ever see that one? No, for real, man. For real. Some, who's seen that? Yeah, I know, right? The young folks. The progressive ones. The ones who are the next generation who have God figured out. We don't need them. We don't need him. We're, but we're snorting condoms up one nostril and out the other. That's the new thing. Yeah, people are getting real smart here in this country, I can tell you. Real smart. Well, I was reading an article this week. It's in, back in 2013. It was a long, 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 long time ago, right? It was the New York Post. And uh, 
There were some researchers that got together from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they partnered with the United States Department of Education, and they, re- they did some research. They, they pulled 166,000 people from across the world in over 20 countries, and they gave them some, some challenges, math, reading, these are basics, right? And some problem solving using some technology and American adults scored below the international level. Like, we're not getting smarter, y'all. We're not. But it's a worldwide epidemic. It's not just America that's falling fast. We may be falling compared, more compared to others, but the whole world's not getting smarter either. It's not like everyone else is getting so smart and we're falling behind. Listen, I don't know much about the IQ test. I don't even know what mine is or what they ask. But I know that the worldwide IQ has dropped from 91.5 in 1950 to 88 in 2015. It's dropping. We're not getting smarter. So it's surely not that intellect has exceeded divinity by any means. It's that hypocrisy has surpassed authenticity. That's the problem. Now, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, being a hypocrite, you know, those Christians are all hypocrites, right? You hear that in church all the time, right? That's a church word, and I've used it a lot too. You know, hypocrisy, that's a nasty little word, isn't it? It's an ugly word. Nobody likes the word hypocrite or hypocrisy. It has a, a negative condonation. You know, the, 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 the Greek word for, for hypocrisy, it actually means an actor on the stage, like a faker. But here's the thing about it. Because he or she's a faker, you got to know an actor's not up there being a fake by mistake. They're intentionally acting. They're intentionally being someone that they're not. That's a hypocrite. And so it carries with it, even though in the definition it doesn't necessarily say this, it carries with it this idea of intentionality behind the fact that you claim to be one person, you're being someone else, but you're intentionally doing this. You're aware of this gap, but you choose not to do anything about it because you think it's okay. But listen, not, not all hypocrisy, not, that distance between who you say you are and who you display who you are, that distance between the two, it may be far, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that it's wicked and intentional. Sometimes, even though that gap is big, it's not intentional, it's actually sincere. There's a lot of sincerity in a lot of this hypocrisy that we see. Remember the first week we started in this, this, this message series, we talked about the KKK, and we talked about this other group, Christian Identity, quoting Bible verses. You know, you saw that we put the creed up on the screen for the KKK. We all know they're sick in the head, right? Crazy people. But we saw up on, the, on their creed, the thing you have to swear to when you join the group is that you believe in God and you obey the tenets of the Christian faith. They believe that they are following Christ. And the pastor and the members of Westboro Baptist Church, you know, the ones who are holding up the signs that say, you know, I hate fags and I hate Jews and, and, and God, God hates America and thank God for 9-11. Like these crazy, insane people, they're sincere. They literally believe that what they're doing is right. It's not a matter of insincerity. It's a matter of lack of authenticity. Authenticity is the display of the genuine article. Jesus, listen, Jesus is perfect. Jesus is beautiful. Christianity is perfect. Christianity is beautiful. And like anything that is beautiful, people are drawn toward it. They're not pushed away from it. And that's the reason for the Bible. The reason why this is here is so we would pick it up and that God would use this to purge everything out of you that you have when you were born. All that nasty sin, the anchovies on the pizza, it all has to come out and get replaced with beauty. That's why we're here right now. That's why we're here. Look, look, I want to bring up our identity statement on the screen. You guys all should memorize this. 
If anyone asks you about our church, this is what you should say. Hey, we're Revolution Church. We're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's why we're in church, so that we could teach you what real Christianity is and then encourage you to live it out before a watching world. That's why the church exists, and that's why you're here right now, tonight. And that's what Paul was doing with Philemon. And at the beginning of this book, he lists who he's writing it to, Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and all the people that are meeting there in their home church. And his desire is to take the word of God and to transform these people so they could be an authentic display of Christ and his faith, Christianity, before the people in Colossae where they lived. So we're not just supposed to say that God's word is our standard and God's word is our guide. We're actually supposed to live it out. That's what authentic really is. A couple of months ago, um, I preached a message called Life in the Gap. I don't know how many of you were here for that. It was a, I thought it was a good message, no credit to me, but I think it was helpful. It was talking about this gap that we live in, you know, between the time that, you, that a promise has been made, right? God gives you a promise either through someone who speaks a word of pr- prophetic word over you or you read something in scripture or you pray and God tells you something. He promises something. And then further on down the line, there's going to be a day because he is what? Faithful. Let's hear it. Because he is what? He's faithful. Because he's faithful, you know that there's a time between when he promised something and when he fulfills it. You know it's coming, but you live in the gap. We live in that time period of waiting, right? And we talked about how we're supposed to live. It's a good gap. That's a good gap. But the gap that I want to talk to you tonight about, it's not a good gap at all. Let me tell you about what this gap is. Let me me do this. You got your hand there and your finger in, in Philemon, but... Do me a favor, just briefly go to Psalm 19. Back in the Old Testament, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a good psalm, man. It's like a condensed version of Psalm 119. (laughs) So if you want the cliff notes on Psalm 119, if you get punished and your parents tell you to write down Psalm 119, just go to Psalm 19 and and write that down and say that's the cliff notes. Okay, Psalm 19, verse 14 says this. Here's a gap. See if you pick it up. He says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. So you see, he's like, listen, what's going on inside of you, this, what you believe, what you're thinking, what you can see, God, and nobody else can, I want that to be pleasing to you. But I also want the stuff that comes out of my mouth, my life, the things that everybody else can see. I want that to be pleasing as well. Do you see the call to consistency? He wants them both, the inside and the outside, to match. That there'd be no gap, you see? Before there was a gap between the promise and the fulfillment. But in this situation, he doesn't want us to have a gap. He wants what's inside and what's coming out should be the same. Titus 2.1 in the Holman Christian Standard says, But you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. You see here again, what comes out of your mouth should be consistent which, with sound teaching. That means that what comes out of your mouth should be the same as what you find here. The truth and what you say and what you teach should be the same. They should match. That means no gap. Last but not least, 1 Timothy 4.16. Turn there. I want you to see it. This one's huge. 1 Timothy 4.16. This, has, this is super, super important. 1 Timothy 4.16. Tell me when you're there. There was a day I couldn't, I couldn't preach with a microphone in my hand. I'm too Jewish, man. I, gotta, I think I, I need to talk with my hands, and this is kind of restricting. But God is good, man. You like it because you can hear me now. See, that's good, yeah. So listen to this. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. 
Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Look at someone next to you and say, this is an important message. This is a super important message because your salvation and the salvation of other people around you depend on what that just said. What does it say again? Look at it. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. So he says, the stuff that you say should match the things that you do. And then it says, stay true to what is right. For the, right? So that means you have to stay true to the truth, right? We need to know what the truth is, and we need to live it out and say it and speak it and teach it. It all should have the same thing. No gap. That's what he's saying, because your salvation depends on that. You could praise Jesus all day. You could be one of them annoying people who talks about Jesus 24-7, but if it's the wrong Jesus, if it's not the Jesus of the Bible, you're going to hell. you gotta, you got to stay true to the, to, to the reality that's found in the Scriptures. You, you need to know who Jesus is so you can worship him correctly. You, 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 I, I could call this bottle of water Jesus Christ and y'all should bow to it and you could bow real well let me ask you a question how many people believe that this bottle of water is going to get you to glory and that's what people are doing as they withhold sections of scripture and they don't tell the truth and they don't engage with people and tell them what's up with the Bible because they want to fill us they want to fill a room they want to keep friends they don't want to offend anybody Y'all don't look at me like that. You do it too, right? We all do it. But we can't do that anymore. God's word is clear that what is displayed and what is true should match no gap. And what is believed, in other words, truth is here. We got this right here, right? Hold up the truth. Hold up the truth. Let me see. Who's got a Bible? Man, it's awesome, right? Bible church. So this is the truth, right? We need to stay true to what is true. What is true and what is displayed should be the same. So what it says should be what I say and what I do. You, what it says should match what you see in me. Right? That's, that's what real Christianity is. And then also what's believed, not, not, not just what's true, because a lot of people believe stuff, it's just not true. And they live out what they believe sincerely. The KKK. I'm just using them as an example, right? But that's true. They are sincere and passionate about their beliefs that they are following Christian tenet, that they are following Christ. That's, there's, a, there's no shortage of sincerity in their stupidity. But they're sincere. So it's important to understand the truth, but then it says here, what is, be, what is believed? So your interpretation of the truth your decision on what the truth is, this book, what's inside and what is displayed so what everyone can see should be the same. No gap. So there's four things, right? The truth, what is believed, what is taught, and what is displayed should match. No gap, y'all. No gap. All four of them should be identical. At all times, do you agree with this? I agree. So, we proclaim to you what God's word says. I, I read you these, Psalm 19, Titus 2, 1 Timothy 4. I proclaimed, I explained what that means, and now applied. You ready for it to apply? Here we go. So, if, if Jesus' death on the cross is the single payment for the sin of, of for all sin, for all of the human race... And you can doubt that if you want, but if you do, you just need to read Hebrews 10, 12. But if you believe that that's what it is, and by accepting it as your payment, it puts you in right standing with God into the family of God as a child of God and a friend of God, then we have no choice but to receive all who would do the same with open arms. Every single person. He is not exclusively the, the, the God of the Jew. Okay, He's not. And, and the Jews thought that he was. And they didn't want to share him. All throughout the Old Testament. Like, read Jonah, man. 
He didn't want to share his God with these nasty Gentiles that were sinners like he wasn't. He didn't want to share, they didn't want to share their God with Gentiles. The, the problem with that is that they had this misunderstanding. They, they love God and everything, but if he really is God, then doesn't he deserve to be praised and worshipped by every single person? Because if he's not praised and worshipped by every single person, then there's a lot of different gods. And why would you want to worship one? Like that. That's lame, man. My God against your God. What if your God wins? Rock them, sock them robots, and you win. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to worship that God. But they didn't want to share their God. And so he was going to be the God of the Gentile, too. He even said in their Old Testament that he was going to be the God of the Gentiles. They still didn't want to share him. But he's the God of all people. In Colossians 3.11, it says, In this new life, in this new life, there's no, not, neither Greek, some translations will say Gentile or Jew. Let, let me just break it down a little bit more. Circumcised or not. Barbaric. You ever see them Capital One ads? What's in your wallet? Those guys with the big furs and the helmets, like, you know, with the horns on and stuff, the crazy people who eat chicken legs. Right, those guys. It doesn't make any difference if you're like this proper gentleman with a top hat. Or, I'm this guy. It doesn't make any difference if you're slave or free in this new life. Y'all know about the new life? We got a new life, right? When you said yes to Jesus Christ, did you know that you died? Did you all know that you, that you were dead? You were once dead in your sins and trespasses. But now, because of what Christ has done on the cross, you're a new creation, right? You're a new, you're a new person. People can't tell you what you used to be because that guy's dead. That girl's dead and buried, man, and, and you are raised to new life. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, the new man, right? And so it says here, in this new life, for all those people that have said yes to Jesus and they've been reborn, they're a new person, a new creation, in that whole thing that God has done through Christ, he's got this family he formed. And in that family, it doesn't make any difference who you are. It says that's all that matters is Christ in you. It doesn't make any difference who you were. And so the, <laughs> the Jews, they didn't want to share this God with anybody. No, that's our God. Get your own God. They could get their own God. Is, is he the only God? That's stupid. But they didn't want to share the God. But he's like, no, I'm going to make those people that weren't a people, now they're a people. And it says in the scripture, I, I form, that Jesus formed one family by breaking down the wall of hostility between the Jew and the Gentile. Now I have one family, and they span the globe. <laughs> and so now, here in this book right here in Philemon, what's happening is just like the old Jews, now here's the new, it's always them stinking Jews, man, and I'm one of them. These new Christians, the, the first Christians, they were Jews. You know what's going bad then, right? These, these, these new Christians, these Jews, they didn't want to share God with the Gentiles. Some things just don't change, man. And they didn't want to share Jesus, God, with the Gentiles. Like, hey, man, we're on to something good, but we don't want to share with those uncircumcised types. So now Paul is writing a letter to these folks and just like the old first christians didn't want to share just like the jews the ancient jews way back they didn't want to share and now these new converts here philemon aphia archippus all the people that are meeting in that church you know all the all the all the all the you know like ned flanders on on the simpsons right he's a, listen not everybody's like that not everybody's an upstanding member of society. Not everybody's prim and proper. Not everybody comes to church and they're Sunday best, man. And, and, and so he's like, he, he, he's talking to these people. He's saying, hey, listen, all you wealthy and prosperous and powerful people, you know, Philemon, you're a wealthy slave owner and you're the pastor of this church and you got people coming into your church so you have some influence and you're wealthy and everyone looks up to you. And, 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 but I, listen, I want you to display authentic Christianity by accepting someone who's way different into your family. I want you to accept the former slave the former, the former thief 
into your fellowship. It's calling them to high water mark, right? And what about here in America today? What about for us? Maybe that means to, maybe it means someone of different color, maybe a different age, maybe a different style. Y'all like my shoes? What if you don't? You better like me anyway. What about different worship styles? What about, what about someone who likes to listen to old hymns, man? Is that okay? What about if we crank up some elevation at about 95 decibels? Is that all right? Why not, right? Everybody's different in the, in the church. Maybe it's someone who's rich or poor. Maybe it's someone like myself who's a, who, who's a Jew, right? Is that okay if the Jews come in with, a, with their different background, man, than, than, than you have? Maybe some of us come in with a Baptist background. And maybe some of us come in with a, with a Catholic background. When you're in Catholic church, you don't talk. You hear me? <laughs> but what if you come in with a, with a straight-up Pentecostal background where you can't stop talking in church? Is that okay to hang out together? What if we have a record? And I don't mean the Beatles. What if you're a Republican or a Democrat? What if you're white collar? What if you're blue collar? What if you're rich? What if you're poor? Different, different, different. In our foolishness here in America, we had a time where we tried to do separate but equal. Say, that was stupid. Real stupid. But God says something different. He says, in, in this new life, there's one body and one spirit and one hope and one Lord and one faith and one God and one mediator between God and man. It's Christ. And so Christian churches should be striving to invite and welcome all who would receive the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. I'm embarrassed to tell this story. But we're supposed to be transparent in church. I think I told it years and years and years ago, but y'all are new. You never probably heard this one before. So, so back when I was a kid, and don't laugh at me because I know you guys probably did the same thing, okay? So we had, uh, I was probably, I mean, it's, I'm a thousand years old, so I don't know exactly how, how old I was, but I would say I was probably, I don't know, like somewhere between like eight and 12, somewhere in that range, probably not closer to 12, but somewhere around there. So, so we built, we had this club. Anyone ever been a member of a club when you were a kid? Raise your hand if you're a member of, the, of a club. Several of us. Okay, I was the member of the I Hate Adam Club. That was the name of the club. So, so this is, I, I, I hope he's not watching on Facebook. But uh, so there was this kid, he lived next door to me. His name was Adam. I won't say his last name. <clears throat> and we were friends. We were like best friends growing up. We used to play all the time. Back in the day when you'd go outside and play and not get killed. You know those days? You remember them days? And, and you'd go out in the woods. you just play all day. Not down here in Florida. I love Florida, but you don't play in the woods in Florida as much. It's like snakes and alligators and stuff, right? They just kill you. But up there, like, there's space, like the legs of the trees, be, uh, like the legs of the table. You could, like, get between trees and stuff. It's not covered in that, you know, that underbrush with all the palmettos and stuff like that. So, you like, you play out in the woods a ton. And we used to, we built a fort back there. Man, this, we, we, I was part of the I Hate Adam Club. We all, we all ganged up on the street, all the kids. And, and there was Eric and, and it was Billy and his, and his young brother Tim and Barbara and, and Linda. And behind Linda Sheckman's house, we, we had a, we built a fort, man. We built a fort to hate Adam. And I don't even remember what he did wrong, but there was, there was this hate going on for this kid, Adam. And we, we literally built a fort. We took, like, old roofing material. Like, you guys have built forts, right? You get some downed trees, and you get some old roofing material, maybe some cardboard or whatever, and you get some sticks across the top, and you put some leaves. And, and we built a fort to hate Adam. It was the I Hate Adam Club. It's pretty funny. It's crazy though, dude. It was it was it was a group 
that was based on everyone hating one person. But Christianity is based on one person who loves everyone. It's totally different. And we have to change our mindset about the way we look at people. And that's what Paul is saying to Philemon. I need you to change your mindset. This guy's a slave. He stole from you. He ran away. He went to jail. He's a bad dude, and society looks down on him. He used to be nothing to you, but now I'm saying he's going to be something to you. He's not just a slave. He's a brother in Christ. If you love me and you welcome me as a partner, bring him back in the same way. Treat him like you would treat me if I was coming to your house. Romans 3.22 says this, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who you are. Someone's got to say amen there, man. Holy goodness gracious. So, if that's true, Romans 3.22 is true. That by placing your faith in Christ, you're made right with God. So, so if I've done that and I've done what i got to do to be right with God, shouldn't I be right with you? Who are you? <laughs> right? I mean, let's, just be, let, let's talk about that, right? I mean, if, 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 I've, if I've done what I have to do to be right with the creator of heaven and earth, so shouldn't, I be, shouldn't that be good enough to be right with you? And some of us, listen now, some of us are setting standards that are different and higher than Jesus sets, so I could be right with you. You can't, you, you can't be black and be my brother. You, 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 you can't like that new, that, 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 that elevation music. That's all they just repeat. It's all emotionally driven. You're going to hell. Really? Do you know in heaven what they're going to do? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come forever. You better get used to repeating yourself. But so, so, so it's okay for God. He likes that song, but Mercy doesn't like it, so she can't accept me. Picking on you. Some of us are setting standards that are higher and different than Jesus himself. But the Bible says that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you lived, no matter how big your pile of sin no matter your crime, no matter your political affiliation, no matter how you voted, no matter what your, you could be a Seminole or you could be a Gator. And it, it listen, Christ is in you. That's all that matters, man. Amen. That's all that matters. So the truth in Paul and what he preached had no gap. And so Paul is the genuine article. There, there, his credibility was off the charts good, okay? So let me, let me show you what I'm talking about, some more applications. Let me just show you what he did and, and how we should live, okay? Uh, 2 Timothy, you, got, you were in 1 Timothy right there, right? 2 Timothy, just one book over, just like a p- couple pages over to the right. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <laughs> Paul says this to, to Timothy, his, his young protege, his young Jedi, his young Jedi. <laughs> he says to his young Jedi, after he says that all of Scripture is God-breathed and you're supposed to use it to teach us what's correct and that God uses it to prepare all of his people for every good work. Like, what do people need to hear? Stories about your dog? No. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to hear stories about the I Hate Adam Club. What you need to hear is the Word of God. And so he says right here, he says, beginning of chapter 4, he says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Like, so he's putting the pressure on him, right? I'm going to urge you to do something. By the way, Jesus is watching. He says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, Preach the word. Preach the word of God. He says, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. The Holman Christian Standard says something similar, just a little bit different, just in the wording, but he says the same thing. I encourage you because Jesus is coming to set up his kingdom. He's going to judge everybody. He says, proclaim the message. 
persist in it, whether convenient or not. So he doesn't just say, hey, tell people about Jesus. It's not like, a one, hey, we're going to go out, we're going to evangelize the community, we're going to the playground, and we're going to see all these kids out there, and there's their parents on the swings, and they're held captive, and they don't want to be there anyway, so we're going to go up, and we're going to talk to them, and we're going to share the gospel with them. That's awesome. But he says, listen, proclaim the message, preach the word, but persist in it. Keep doing it. Keep telling people about me. Keep going. Keep going. Never stop. Never enough. Always more. Persist in it, whether it's convenient or not. How many people are always in the mood to be godly? How many people in this room are always in the mood to do the right thing? How many people in this room are always in the mood to open their mouth and share the good news of Jesus Christ? Not all the time. But he says, I want you to persist in it, whether it's convenient or not, whether the time is favorable or not. Let me ask you a question. Is Paul sincere? I'm just going to say, I, I guess. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know Paul. Is he sincere in what he's saying? Well, you say yes, maybe. I say maybe. Because I, 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 I don't know. I mean, he's, he's, he's preaching. He's teaching. Like, because even if he means what he says, he could still be a hypocrite if he isn't authentic and doing what he says others should do. See, a true Christian, an authentic Christian, a real Christian doesn't teach one thing and then do another thing. There's no gap in that man or a woman. That's a real Christian. Like, don't you hate that guy? Don't we all hate that guy? Don't you hate the guy who says, y'all should be doing this, but they won't do it? Don't tell me to go someplace you've never been and un unwilling to go. Don't tell me to give. Don't tell me to pray. Don't tell me to come. Don't tell me to serve if you won't. You know, I stood up, I stood up here for weeks and weeks and weeks and told you, we're opening up this coffee shop, y'all should serve. Wouldn't that be nice if you found out that I wasn't helping at all? And don't make excuses for me while you're busy. I appreciate that. I'm not busy enough. What does he say? Persist in telling people. And so I need to be here just like you. Don't you hate the guy who says, the girl who says, y'all should do this, but then you find out they ain't doing it. You want to listen to that person? I sure as heck don't. But let's take a look at authentic Paul. In the first verse of Philemon, what does it say? I, Paul, a prisoner for preaching the gospel. This dude's in jail. Why? He, has, he done something, has he done something really wrong? No. no. What has he done? He preached the gospel. So he's out there in the, in, 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 in the synagogues, and he's out there in the marketplace, and he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrant. He goes to all these different places, and he's preaching the gospel from city to city. And what happens when he goes from city to city? He gets whipped, beaten, and imprisoned. He's literally in prison for preaching the gospel. So listen, so if you're in jail for preaching the gospel, and, and by the way, side note, it's not like in America where you're innocent until proven guilty and you get a, a court-appointed lawyer or you're a rich man or woman and you get the best guy to represent you and you get a judge or a, or a jury of your peers. No. Back then, if they didn't like what you did, they just chuck you in jail. There was one time that they brought Paul up to the, the local magistrate and they just beat him with wooden rods. There was often times that they would beat him and punish him and then find out he was innocent afterwards. It wasn't innocent until proven guilty. Like, if you're in jail for preaching the gospel, what's the one thing you don't want to get caught doing in jail? Preaching the gospel, right? You ain't, <laughs> there's no lawyers and judge. Like, you're, if they chuck you in jail and whip and beat you for preaching the gospel, you better stop preaching the gospel if you ever even want a chance to get out. So the one thing that you don't want to do is preach the gospel. So let me ask you a question. Is in jail for preaching a favorable time for preaching? Is it convenient? 
Is it, a fa- is it a good time to preach the gospel when you're in the, in the chains for preaching the gospel? No. But look in verse 10 of Philemon. I appeal to you for my son, for Onesimus, who became my son in the faith while I was here in chains. He didn't just say preach the gospel when it's not favorable. He did. He did it. There was no gap. That's Paul. And that's supposed to be you. What Paul believed and what he taught and what he did, no gap. He was authentic. He was real. And how many of us say that we are Christians? We, we, know, we know what it says. We know what it says. But we make excuses for blowing off church. Prayer is sporadic. Giving is optional. Loving is conditional. Let's face it, obedience is occasional. But not Paul. Not Paul. And this letter is written so that hopefully the same could be said about Philemon and Aphia and Archippus and all the people there in their church and the reader, which is you and me. Right? That's why we read it. To shrink the gap. Between the truth, what is believed, and what is lived. And that's why we're here. Jesus commissioned us. Listen, okay. Jesus commissioned us to make disciples of of who? All people, right? And teach them all that I've taught you. So hold up what you're supposed to teach them. Hold it up. Hold it up, right? So we know. Where's the truth? Right here, right? It's in your hand. So the truth is to go make disciples of all people and teach them all that I've taught you. Now, that's the truth. 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul says, Commit what you've heard to faithful men who will teach others. So he, he, he's agreeing with the truth, right? The truth is, Jesus said, go make disciples and teach them. And he's saying, I believe that. And then he's teaching us to go make disciples. So we know the truth And we know what is believed and what is taught. No gap, right? And then verse 10. My brother Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while I was here in in chains. So what the truth is, what Paul believed, what Paul taught, and what Paul did, what is it? No gap. Perfect. We make excuses for our lack of obedience, and then we fall on grace, hoping to soften the blow all the time. But Paul didn't, listen, did Paul, did Paul ever say, hey man, I preach big, if you read the scriptures, you see that he preached to huge crowds, right? I don't, he preached to groups like this, but he preached, it says in, in he, when he came to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, he preached for like two and a half years so that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. I mean, that's a big crowd, all of Asia. And I believe what the Bible says. When it says all of Asia, I don't mean just a couple people representing. No, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. He preached to huge crowds. And lots of people got saved. And, and he had the power to perform great miracles. Like his, 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 his anointing was so powerful that, that like handkerchiefs and napkins and stuff that had touched his skin. If it touched you, you'd be healed. Like this guy was an apostle. How many people in here are an apostle who have seen and spoken to the risen Christ? Like no one in this room. But Paul was that guy. So so could, could you believe that maybe, maybe, just maybe, he's there in this jail and he says, I don't need to talk to this guy. Who's this guy? I'm, I'm the great apostle Paul. I spoke to the multitudes, man. I performed miracles. And now I'm not going to talk to this lowly, thieving slave here. He could have said that, right? But he didn't. But he didn't. The best thing I can think of in today's culture is to think about someone like Billy Graham. Preach to the multitudes across the earth. I watched some of his stuff lately, as some of you have because of his passing, where you just see it's mind-blowing, right? You you, you know on New Year's Eve when when they have like Dick Clark's rocking New Year's Eve thing and there's like, you know, 50,000, 100,000 people packed into Times Square? million 
Yeah, Billy Graham did that, preaching the gospel. Like, I'm excited that y'all are here tonight. He packed Times Square with like a million people. Madison Square Garden. All these huge stadiums across the world. But he talked to one person. And we're supposed to have that same attitude that he would have. The same attitude that Paul would have. He didn't make excuses. He persisted. And this isn't just strictly about evangelism, guys. 1 Timothy 6, 18 says, Be generous and willing to share. But some are stingy and greedy and poor tippers. And you know who you are. Jesus says we should forgive 70 times, 7 times. But we walk around with a grudge. Yeah, you don't know what he, he did to me. I'll, I'll forgive everyone. I'll forgive that guy. <laughs> Get him, God. Smite him. Pray for our enemies. Don't neglect gathering. Be kind and tender hearted. Love endures all things. I don't love you anymore. True Christianity is beyond sincerity, it's authentic. And this is what authentic sounds like, and this is how authentic is displayed. No gap. That's what authentic Christianity is. So as we get ready to wrap it up here tonight, I just want to say a couple things in closing. Our world is filled with people that are sincere. They mean what they do. They mean what they say. The world does not lack sincerity in any way. Yet there's no shortage of hypocrisy, is there? So might we here at Revolution be known for our authenticity? That the truth, that what we believe, that what we speak and teach, and what we display, how we live, that there'd be no gap. Are we going to, let me ask you, are we going to fail in displaying authentic Christianity often? I think all of us should admit that. The scriptures say all of us fail in many ways, and it's so very true. But, but even though we fail to display it all the time, can we be a people, if we're going to bring beauty to the world, can we be a people that strive to learn the truth, to strive to share the truth, to strive to live the truth, so that when people look at you, they won't see a gap. They'll see God. And that's what we're looking for. Would you stand with me, please? Let's pray. And then we're going to worship the Lord.